Uh, current facts and figures from the World Health Organization suggest that the coronavirus has been making a comeback that's more devastating than the first wave. The United States of America continues to post stunning figures about infections and hospitalizations as uh, something in the region of 200,000 active cases per day. Here in Nigeria, the figures do not sound as scary as that, but experts say the truth about the country's statistics on COVID-19 is still largely hidden in the fine lines between how much contact tracing and testing is being done and how many cases are, active cases are slipping through the net on a daily basis. I will be joined for a discussion by Dr. Rukewe uh, Uguma, uh, consultant of family medicine and former special advisor to the Delta State Governor on Health Monitoring and former consultant to the Senate on our Health. She will also be discussing the assessment of how COVID-19 situation has been managed in Nigeria, especially at the grassroots level. Let me start with you, uh, Doctor as regards how this has been managed at the grassroots level. You move everywhere now. If you wear a face mask, maybe somewhere in, uh, in Refinery Road in Worry, for instance, you will be seen as an odd man out. It looks as though our communities have moved off COVID-19 itself. What is happening? I just came from Toronto um, last week um, because of a funeral. And um, I was really astonished to see that no, there was no social distancing no face mask. In fact, they told me, Madam, there's no coronavirus here. And um, so that's a real concern because we know that um, it's a virus that started in Wuhan, China, and um, from there it spread all over the world. And even the index um, case in Nigeria um, was imported. So we know there is a person-to-person -person transmission. The virus doesn't move. Humans move the virus. Now, there's an interesting study that came out a couple of weeks ago that said um, the countries with high endemic malaria cases have some cross immunity um, um, to COVID. And this is um, a study by Azu uh, Munir over in 110 countries where there's malaria endemicity. So there may be something there why it didn't catch on, because um, as you can see, there's over um, 250,000 deaths in the United States. And um, um, in Nigeria, we, had, we don't even have up to 2,000 deaths. And so you can see that. There is something protecting us aside from um, not obeying the rules that, um, that are of convention. For example, in Canada, we are neighbors to the United States where I reside. We have about um, less than about 10,000 deaths with about 200, less than 300,000 cases, um, active cases uh, in total and actually about 200, um, 200,000 recovered people. So what am I saying? We are neighbors within the United States and, and in Canada. And um, yet you can see that our deaths are really, really low. And so what's the difference is those, um, those simple measures that we took. So it was mandated by the, um, by the government. The prime minister came out every day to address um, the nation and said, everyone wear a mask. If you don't wear a mask, it's a crime. Where you can't um, social distance, you must wear a mask. And in fact, they reduced um, the numbers that can gather. You know, before they allowed up to 15 um, persons. Now I think it's, it's further reduced to five. And when we increased it to 50, we saw a second wave. Again, with this um, winter coming, uh, you know, when whenever winter is coming, we know the the coronaviruses um, thrive a lot. And so with winter coming, we know there's a second wave. And of course, we had the Thanksgiving. Um, um, over the weekend, and we saw a mass, um, a great rise, sharp rise in, 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 the, in the virus spread. So, in Nigeria today, we haven't really got the same numbers as, um, as we would have thought, because like I said, some people say UV light, some people say malaria and demicity, but somehow, um, we're still getting increased cases in the last six weeks. Um, I, I've seen the numbers rise very sharply. So I know, for example, that even though we are not experiencing the same pandemic as the rest of the world, we are still at risk because one person dying from a preventable cause is one person too many. And um, of course, there's hope. We're talking about a vaccine um, eventually um, coming up. Um, the Pfizer has a really good, um, really good study going on um, showing us that um, with the vaccine, with the 90% efficacy, we could get protected from this virus, just as uh, influenza. Every year, we have to get the flu shot. And we know that the flu vaccine actually has um, protection. We guess what the strain will be, and um, we take it in advance. And we will still get the virus, but um, it mitigates the effect so you don't die from influenza. So we think that this particular vaccine would um, cut across a lot of things and help 
prevent deaths from um, coronavirus. The truth is, until we get herd immunity, we can't get rid of this virus. Herd immunity means more than 60, 70 percent of the population have, have been infected, and so they will not um, um, now have the same mortality rate. To be honest, all over the world, um, coronavirus is really feared. Um, but I've seen it, in, like you said, in Refinery Road in Worry. People are going about their business uh, as if nothing's going on. Go to Balogu Markets. You look like an alien when you're trying to, to wear a mask. And they say, like, what, what are you doing? So there's something protecting us, be it our local herbs, our go, I don't know, the gene or whatever it is. But still don't take it for granted. People are very, um, some people are very prone to this. Um, I'm talking elderly people, people with diabetes. Um, comorbidities would um, definitely be more at risk uh, for catching this, this virus. So don't take it for granted. Um, if you're in the, same herd, um, in the same community, you may take the risk of not using a mask. But if you're going to be introduced to new populations, especially if you're, um, if you're traveling, please use a mask. Wash your hands frequently. Do social distancing until we can get the vaccine. And we know that this vaccine will become even widely available, probably late in 2021. So we still have a long way to, to get to the end of this pandemic. And as you can see, the numbers are rising everywhere in the world, including Nigeria. So I don't know what else I, I can add to this, but for sure, coronavirus is not a myth. Uh, we see, like you said, we have 200,000 active cases a day in the United States. And over 250,000 people dead. You can imagine this room. We have about, I don't know, 20 people. So 20 people dead in a room. You can imagine how, how um, huge that number is. And of course, in, in the world today, we have um, over 1.5 million people dead from this virus. Now, I'm really curious about what they did in China, because um, this started in, in Wuhan, China. And um, for now, I saw they had a water park party about a couple months ago. So for sure, they had the virus. They conquered the virus by very stringent measures, which, you know, very difficult to replicate because it severely affects the economy when you say don't go anywhere, um, don't, um, don't trade, um, don't, um, don't um, do any social activity or any economic act activity. So you must support that system. And I don't think we have those um, kinds of um, support systems in Nigeria. Now in Canada, Part of why we succeeded is the government gave out um, palliatives. I'm talking, they gave um, supplementary income, especially to students and to unemployed um, persons. And even small businesses got um, loans with forgiveness of up to $10,000. They got $40,000 to assist them to stay locked down. And so our numbers keep being low, even though now, like I said, there's a second wave and we're doing more stringent um, um, lockdown measures and we're targeting the measures. Uh, for example, we can, Using um, apps and all, um, all the um, technology, we can see the hotspots where the virus is going and we can target those areas and do more um, mitigation in those areas. So uh, it's something that is going to be around for a while, unfortunately. I, I know Dr. Fauci was saying that by April, um, people who want the vaccine can get the vaccine. The truth is, I don't know how soon we can get the vaccine down to, to these parts, especially when people are not really falling down on the streets dying from, from coronavirus. So it's a very, very interesting um, dynamic. We're still studying the virus. We don't know the full epidemiology of it. And we think for sure it's going to be here for some time. Well, Dr. Nguba, you have uh, more or less addressed uh, most of the issues. And uh, you have given advice to the average Nigerian who is very cynical about COVID-19. But what would you advise government to do, particularly at the primary health care level? Because yes, there is cynicism in the urban areas, but the people in uh, rural Nigeria, who are the ones uh, who could be most affected in the event of a second or third wave, uh, they don't even believe that there's anything called COVID-19. How do we get the message uh, down to the uh, people to say, look, there is no divine protection? This is real. Yeah. So it's education, education, education. We know what worked in, in, in countries where they had very high, high numbers. Like I said, it started in China. They did all this uh, mitigation with sanitation and, um, and um, hand washing, distancing, um, and um, wearing your face mask. We think, I think, wearing the face mask is probably the single most important protective measure. So I would say in the grassroots, in primary health centers, um, the community health extension workers, you know, the lo local government um, chairman, they need to sensitize the people that 
one case of coronavirus can make the whole community infected. So you want zero cases, actually. And to get that, you need to mitigate the spread. The virus doesn't spread. Humans spread the virus. And simple measures like hand washing, increasing your hygiene, actually not just prevents um, coronavirus, it prevents a lot of gastrointestinal um, diseases and many, many infections. So improving your hygiene is important. Wash your hands frequently. I'm sure they talked about 20 second long hand washing. If you don't have um, um, soap and water, which is, you know, sometimes in rural communities, is not um, readily available, you can still use um, um, buckets, um, um, you know, as long as it's um, not stagnant water. And many, many um, interventions can be done. Simple devices like, you know, like the local government, um, they could have um, buckets with taps installed in them. These are things the government could do to help people. You know, in, in various places, in markets, in schools. And then, you know, the mask can be very innovative. It doesn't have to be expensive. It could be a simple um, cloth covering. But we should tell them that they should use it, especially as you see the numbers um, rising. Until we get a good answer, like a vaccine, where it's all at, at, at risk. One person in this globe having coronavirus means we are all at risk because the virus will spread. Once there's movement, there will be virus spread. So everyone should be on board, the state governors, the federal government. I, I know there's a lot of, um, they call it COVID-419 because we did, they didn't believe that um, the pandemic was really, um, was really real. But uh, I do know that it is real. I have come from those parts and um, we don't really have it catching on here because there must be some protective uh, measures. Like I said, there's some studies going on, yet we still have it. It's not free. There's testing. Um, the people test it daily and there's still positive cases in Nigeria and there's still deaths from it. Unfortunately, I lost a colleague in Delta State, a very good anesthetist um, from the virus, who was um, relatively healthy before that. So I know the virus is real. And if you catch it, sometimes you will not survive. So don't take it for granted. Everyone should be on board. Everyone should take this seriously. Um, if you're with your family members, you don't have to do all these things because you all have the same exposure. But whenever you're going out, do take those measures because I think that's what, like I said, change our numbers between United States uh, and, Canada, um, and Canada. See 10,000 deaths compared to 250,000 deaths. I'm sure the same period of exposure so to tell you what, what um, worked for us and what's still working without the vaccine. Well, your message really cannot be repeated too much. People do need to know. But like you mentioned the vaccine, Pfizer, the announcement was all met with general excitement. There were a few exceptions, but most people were quite excited about the Pfizer vaccine until it started to dawn on us the daunting logistical challenge that it would cause. What about the other vaccines in the offing, like the AstraZeneca one? Do we have a better chance? Because frankly, at this point, the Pfizer vaccine is looking like mission impossible for Nigeria in terms of the cold storage facilities. I'd like you to talk about that. And also in view of what you just said now about COVID-419, the fact that a lot of people still believe that it's a hoax, what it will vaccine hesitance, hesitancy look like in grassroots Nigeria? Will people actually take a vaccine? If at all, there's one that becomes available to us here in Nigeria across the board and can be administered properly without needing to be stored at way below freezing temperatures, for example. Like with all vaccinations, there's a lot of suspicion. Um, I, I know some people even link some vaccinations to infertility in women and whatnot, but we know that vaccines work. We know that's how we eradicated polio uh, in general. And most vaccines require um, cold chain um, and storage. Well, you know, there is um, lots of um, ways to get around this. We have solar fridges. We have mobile, um, like I said, uh, mobile um, containers that can, can keep things cool for many, many hours um, with solar, solar panels. So regarding the AstraZeneca um, vaccine, I know there was, um, I think that had to be pulled back because there was some very bad um, side effects with some, some trials. And so really the, the Pfizer vaccine is the, is the most, um, most um, viable option at the moment. And um, like I said, it's going to be expensive. Governments have to buy it, but I don't think they have a choice in it because they want people to survive. And I know the Gavi um, usually helps fund our vaccines and the Bill Gates Foundation. Actually, um, do, they do a lot. And I know that DHL also partners in, in, um, in spreading, um, I mean, distributing the vaccines in cold chain. 
And so, you know, lots of philanthropy there. And we want to ask, ask people like the Dangotes and any good, um, well-meaning Nigerian to partner in this um, effort because, you know, like I said, one person getting it is all of us um, being at risk because we know it's a, it's a respiratory virus and it's um, airborne. And as you move, you move the virus. Now, to, to sensitize people, um, it's difficult when it's not really catching on, as in people are not dropping dead on the streets. So we just have to keep talking about it, keep highlighting the cases that we have seen, and keep informing them You know that as long as we have this virus, we will not be safe. None of us are safe. But the hygiene me measures actually work. Um, so we keep doing that until, you know, like I said, the last hope for man is, um, is God. Um, I know they spend billions of Nigeria um, in Nigeria every year praying for various things. Um, maybe this is one of the things we should be praying for too. Right. Uh, we'd just like to say a very big thank you, you know, for coming out here and sharing some thoughts as we get uh, COVID-19 and the likes. Dr. Bati? No, no. Okay. I think Not we're still with her. If okay. you still have a question okay, for okay. her, so you can go ahead I, and I've ask her. I've got a question her. for you. Great, great one. You talked about uh, the, the vaccine coaching and the likes. Uh, but I want to talk about something really very important. The need for a, a zero prevalence test to be able to even ascertain where we are in this country. I hear one is on, but can you talk more on the need for zero prevalence test? So the testing, for example, is not for me wide enough and it's not free. For example, I came into this country and I had to pay a certain amount of money to get tested before, um, before I can leave the country again. And uh, so that is a very good way of tracking people coming into the country. But within the country itself, there's not wide testing. And, and I know it's not widely available, which is, which is an issue because you can't really talk about prevalence without testing everyone, to be honest. In Canada, for example, we have, um, we have home kits now that can test, people can test themselves at home with rapid results. And, and you know, that would just almost like a pregnancy test at home. And then you can, if, you, if you're positive, then there's more sensitive um, PCR test. So until we get why testing? We cannot really know the zero prevalence or what the prevalence um, issues are. And as with every test, you know tests are not perfect. So there's false positives and, and false negatives. So really, symptomatic um, testing is really, really important, but there's lots of asymptomatic um, um, carriers. And so in general, doing contract tracing, I think, is critical in mitigating the spread of this um, COVID-19 um, pandemic. So wherever you find a positive case, they need to trace that person down to the wire and everyone needs to get tested because that's how it gets spread. Some people will have very severe respiratory symptoms. Some people will have maybe mild symptoms like they have malaria. And some people will have no symptoms at all. And everyone gets spread. You go and visit your grandmother who is, you know, with, with um, very poor immune immunity and she catches it. And, you know, that's how it goes on and on. So zero prevalence testing um, has to be done when there's widely available test. The test is really expensive at the moment. And um, like I said, there's new technology coming out every day. I would have loved the NCDC to be here to answer the question to what they've done to provide um, those cheaper, widely available tests. Like I said, we have home testing kits available at the moment in Canada and it's improving every single day. More and more companies are coming out with new tests. A new, and there's even the antibody test. So if you've had coronavirus, you want to know uh, do you have antibodies to that? That's a blood test. So it's good to also know whether you're immune to it. We don't know how long the immunity lasts. For example, we know malaria doesn't give you a lasting immunity. Some people get malaria every month. But, you know, those people who have frequent malaria will never die from malaria because they have been exposed. For example, a person who has never had malaria can come and die from malaria because they never had any antibodies. So in general, we need to do testing. We need to keep testing. And we need to keep telling the public that they need to keep doing the things that, are, that have worked in places that had it. I'm talking social distancing, washing your hands frequently, using a face mask, and hopefully we will get a vaccine that would make all our lives go back to normal. I don't think it will happen before 2022, to be honest. I think at least another 18 months of this. Well, earlier on you talked about herd immunity, and herd immunity is a phrase 
that people have been bandying around herd immunity. Is that the uh, best option, last resort, last hope uh, for many countries in Africa where the uh, health infrastructure is weak, uh, public uh, health policy response is, uh, is weak, almost non-existent, uh, not enough testing is being done. And how reliable is that? Because to me, uh, as a non-scientist, it sounds like, well, whoever survives will survive. You know, let the thing go around. At the end of the day, we'll, we'll know whoever is alive, you know, out of this uh, uh, large uh, population. That's one. And then there is a sociological part of it. I mean, as someone living in Canada, hearing stories about Nigerians looting uh, COVID-19 palliatives, how, how did you feel? Uh, what was your response to that? Because COVID-19 palliatives has, have been part of the uh, sociology of this uh, pandemic here in Nigeria. There's a lot of social political problems with Nigeria, but let me first of all address um, the science behind um, herd immunity. So when an infection comes new into a community, um, it's, it starts to spread and then the people develop natural immunity to it. So there's the immunity from vaccination and there's the immunity from getting a natural infection. Of course, superior to any vaccine is the actual infection. So that's why they use, for example, uh, the blood and the plasma of infected um, and patients to treat um, others to, so that they can get rid of the virus. And I'm sure Mr. Trump, when he had his, um, he had all the treatments. Anyways, um, the herd immunity is when most of the population have either gotten the infection or received some protection via a vaccine. And for the spread to be become endemic instead of a pandemic, um, it has to reach at least 70%. Um, of, of, of people infected. Uh, as you said, you know, let, uh, after all, um, what, 54 million people in the world got the virus and, and less than 2 million have died. So for sure, we're going to survive this. But how would you feel if it's your relative that died? So one death is one death too many. And so we can't afford to get those numbers like that. Even though it's a small percentage of deaths that will happen and many people will recover, we don't want that. So we want to prevent it until we get a cure for it, which is a vaccine. So yes, um, regardless of what we do, the infection will spread, but it has to spread at a very, very high rate for us to get 70% of the people to, to have it. And so we don't want to wait for that because a lot of people will die along the way. Like I said, Nigeria has been fortunate. Most of the people are testing every day. I saw the result from the Federal Medical Center in Asaba the other day. And uh, out of, um, I think, 40 or 50 tests, none was, was positive. There was no positive cases that particular day. So, you know, that, that's encouraging. But the truth is, for every positive case, there's thousands of people at risk, people that they've um, come in contact with. So herd immunity is the way to go, yes. But how do we get there? I prefer to go through the vaccine route than via um, natural infection. And um, we want to support those people who have the natural infection um, to recover by not dying. And again, there's very, very different things that have been done in different centers just to make sure about that. But there's no clear cut um, um, particular um, management style that has been recommended because it's really experimental. Now, talking about the palliatives, now I was very disappointed to see that um, in, in the midst of a, a lockdown, there were warehouses f filled with food and, um, and um, things that could make people actually stay at home um, being, being hoarded, and uh, I think for political gain, because they, they were stamped, I saw it on television, they said, um, not for sale. So I, again, I don't understand the rationale about the distribution and what was done, but I know, I know people were really hurting from this, um, from this virus um, um, outbreak and the initial lockdown because everybody was afraid. Nobody knew what was going to, to happen. Um, they locked down the international borders and um, businesses were shut down and some businesses will, will never recover, not just, um, not just here in Nigeria, all over the world um, because of this um, pandemic. So um, government needs to do more. They need to be more transparent. I'm a little bit disappointed with the fact that the, um, for example, the hashtag and stars ended up with bullets. You don't always have to shoot people who want to, to um, lend a voice to what, what, is, um, what is their problem. Government needs to be more attentive. They need to listen. They need to be proactive in acting. They need to act when the people need them to act. 
For example, why are you keeping boxes of indomie and bags of rice in a warehouse? I mean, as you bring them, you distribute them. What's the style of distribution? Again, like I said, this, these are political things, where, you know, and I, I really don't want to um, tell you all I, I think about that. But yes, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. In Canada, once you apply for your, for your um, COVID, um, they call it the CERB, it's five working days. You get your money. And for every month, you get your money. And that's it. And as long as they told you not to go to work, you get your money. Now, if you prove that you lost your job as a result of that, then you go on unemployment insurance. So you are very incented to comply. In fact, in the United States, I was hearing Mr. Trump and his court saying that um, people had more money from their um, checks than their, their jobs. And so they wanted to stop that, which I find actually, actually ridiculous. You know, who wants to get a handout? People who want to work actually want to work. I don't want a handout. Most Nigerians are proud people. If they have a job, they will go to the job. It's when they don't have jobs that they, they start all this looting and whatnot. That's what I think. I, I, you know, some people say Nigerian youths are lazy. I don't believe that. I believe everybody wants to be validated. I believe everybody wants to contribute. I believe everybody wants a healthcare that works for them. As of now, the healthcare doesn't work for Nigerians. Not the primary healthcare system, secondary, or even tertiary system. You need a lot of money to access real healthcare in Nigeria, even till now. And it's, it's really not good enough for a country that is 200 plus million strong with this very robust economy. In our heydays, I don't really know. I mean, we have everybody suffering from this pandemic, but we haven't put policies in place to protect our citizens, neither, like I said, from the grassroots upwards. And really, it's, is it good enough? It's not. Thank you for that. Now to the, I guess, most high profile coronavirus case in the world, the Trump case. And that introduced us to this cocktail that he was treated with of dexamethasone, remdesivir and Regeneron. How available is that in Nigeria? Is that an option or how much of an option is that in this climate? of those three, I could tell you two for sure are not available. I know a very high profile death that happened in Nigeria. I, I won't tell you his name, but they tried to get uh, Rems, Remdesivir from, I don't know, Pakistan or India. Anyways, they couldn't get it. So we don't have those antiviral drugs. Neither we have the experimental drug um, Regeneron, which is used for other things as well. So the answer is no. Between cost and access, we don't have those drugs. Again, Mr. Trump even had, I heard he had a serum um, transfusion as well, and he, he admitted on television he had been self-medicating himself with um, chloroquine. I mean, not self-medicating, someone prescribed it to him. So he was on prophylaxis with chloroquine, yet he still um, caught the virus. So we do not have a good protocol for treating coronavirus, but yet we know the virus can be disrupted. We know that chloroquine, um, actually does something. That's why he was claiming like that. I have two colleagues um, in the United States that swore that until they took their first dose of chloroquine, their fever did not break. So it, again, you throw a lot of things that it says. There's other antivirals like, um, um, oh, my brain is just frying. There's other antivirals that have been tried with coronavirus treatment, with antibiotics like um, acetromycin and, um, and, even Levaquin and some other cocktails, including anti-malaria drugs. So at the end of the day, we don't have a good protocol. We are using anticoagulation as well for the virus because we know that there's coagulation problems and cytokine-induced um, issues. Why people were dying in Italy, for example, they said, burn out the bodies, don't check, don't do autopsies. But the Italian people did autopsies and found that whenever they came back to the ICU, all the people were dead, even though they were oxygen, because their blood wasn't flowing. So they started anticoagulation treatment. So some people use aspirin, some people use Plavix, other drugs. But we know that the, the steroid, dexamethasone, is a very strong steroid. But some people use simple things as prednisone as well. And so that's why I'm really suspicious about the virus. Don't ask me what I think about how the virus started, but it doesn't look to me like a natural virus because it's acting like a malaria um, and it's acting like Ebola and it's acting like um, SARS. You know, it has respiratory. It has so many components that makes me very wary that it's a natural evolution. But regardless, we have many, many 
um, five or six different classes of drugs to treat um, the virus. We're using antimalarials, antivirals, um, antibiotics, and anticoagulants to treat one patient. And for me, I think that is, um, that is just tells you how difficult it is to tackle it when you have it. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Rukewe Ugumba. Uh, this is the major test that humanity faces at the moment. A constantly mutating degenerative uh, disease, pandemic, pathogen, uh, that is putting everyone uh, to the challenge. Some of the issues you have raised, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to take them up with uh, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazo, the head of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, when next, is on this program. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.